Well, how much time was they in the store? Five minutes. Five minutes? Are you sure? Did you look at your watch? No. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You testified earlier that the boys went into this store and that you just begun to make your breakfast. So you were ready to eat and you heard the gunshot. So obviously it takes you five minutes to make breakfast. That's right. Do you remember what you had? Eggs and grits. Next, we have something fun that I think we're just gonna, you're just gonna have to bear with me and see how much fun this one is. This is the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, District of Columbia. And this is Novato Healthcare versus National Labor Relations Board. I, I don't actually know that I care about the parties yet, but I might. Let's see what Chief Judge Garland, uh, Circuit Judge Griffith, and Circuit Senior Circuit Judge Edwards have to say. Opinion for the court filed by Chief Judge Garland. In 1992, Vincent Gambini taught a master class in cross-examination. Trial counsel for the National Labor Relations Board and the National Union of Healthcare Workers apparently paid attention. In this petition for review, Novato Healthcare Center alleges challenges the board's finding that it committed an unfair labor practice by firing four union organizers two days before a union election. As Novato acknowledges, its entire case turns on whether the testimony of one of its supervisors should be credited but the board determined that the testimony should not be credited and trial counsel's cross-examination of the supervisor provides substantial evidence to support that determination. This is, this when they say credited, they literally mean whether it's credible or not credible. Uh, incredible, for example, <laughs> might be a good word to use, that the testimony is so far out there that it is not credible. And so that's what we're talking about here. For this reason and because of other findings that Novato challenges are also supported by substantial evidence, we deny Novato's petition for review and grants the board's cross application for enforcement. So that's where we are. And let's try and figure out what's going on here. Novato operates a skilled nursing facility in California that cares for about 170 patients. On September 16th, 2015, the National Union of Healthcare Workers filed a petition with the National Labor Relations Board to represent a unit of Novato employees. Among its employees leading the the organizing efforts were these four. They attended union meetings, collected show of interest signatures, wore pro-union buttons and lanyards, distributed union regalia, and passed out flyers promoting the union. A lot of this is heavily regulated when you're allowed to unionize, how you're allowed to unionize, whether the company is allowed to regulate or, or prohibit it, and when. Um, very heavily regulated because unions are, are protected in the U.S. Your right to organize is protected to a point on a state by state basis. Novato's management undertook its own union opposition campaign. Although Novato supervisors did not generally work night shifts, facility administrator Darren Trudy asked supervisors to volunteer for those shifts so they could provide union opposition materials to employees and answer their questions. Uh, an outside consulting group that provides employment law advice spearheaded the union opposition campaign. Ten days before the October 14th, 15th representation election, Supervisor Guy Rocha approached uh, employee med medalists uh, to, at, at approximately 6.30 a.m., a relatively new employee asked him how he planned to vote. When he responded that he planned to vote in favor of the union, he told him that doing so would have implications for his pay and that the union could potentially take a portion of his paycheck. Medalist responded that this would not be a problem for him. Uh, October 6th, 7th, medalist Bernalis Brown Sibolino worked the night shift together at Station 4, one of four nursing stations at Novato. During the shift, another employee, Rodriguez, whose union views were and remain unknown, worked at Station 1. At Novato, night shift employees worked from 11 p.m. to 7 or 7.30 a.m. During that shift, employees are allowed two 10-minute rest breaks and one 30-minute meal break. Employees routinely sleep which they are permitted. The supervisor also worked at night shift. Gilman testified that when she arrived at station four, she saw all four employees sleeping. She said she stood in front of the employees for several seconds, up to a minute to see if they would wake up. She testified that she saw another employee sleeping 
sitting in a chair, head down, etc. I'm not sure what the point is here. Okay, timing is almost everything. Gilman testified that at least 15 to 20 minutes passed from the time she first arrived at Station 4 and saw the employees sleeping to the time she took the photograph of the two sleeping employees. If true, this meant that at least two of the Station 4 employees had been sleeping considerably longer than their permitted 10-minute breaks. Gilman then went on to revisit Station 1. She noticed that Rodriguez was still sleeping and informed the charge nurse who woke her up. Gilman estimated that Rodriguez has been asleep for at least 15 to 20 minutes as well. By the time Gilman returned to Station 4 for a fourth time, all four employees there were awake. On the morning of October 7th, Gilman sent Administrator Trudy the photograph and soon thereafter informed him that the five employees had been asleep for 15 to 20 minutes. Trudy suspended all five and initiated an investigation. Outside counsel, as well as an outside consulting group, provided input regarding disciplinary action. Specifically, in an email, uh, they recommended termination of all five employees. Uh, Albert recognized that Rodriguez was a bit of a different story because her charge nurse appears to have tolerated her sleeping, still recommended her termination, giving her lesser discipline in this situation sends the wrong message. It is possible that the Labor Relations Board or judge could view her situation as being less serious, but I would rather you take that risk than risk that letting her remain employed somehow dilutes our arguments with the other four. October 12th, two days before the scheduled election, Trudy fired all five employees for sleeping on duty. The NLRB conducted the election. The union won. Soon after, the union charged Nevada with committing unfair labor practices, and the NLRB general counsel issued a complaint. Gilman testified, as recounted above, the two Station 4 employees captured in the photograph, Brown and Sabolino, acknowledged that they had slept, but said they did so only during their permitted 10-minute breaks. Bernalis testified that although he had rested during his allowed meal break, he did not sleep after returning to Station 4 at 4 a.m. Medalist testified that he did not sleep at all during that shift. Rodriguez, the Station 1 employee, did not testify. Following a multi-day hearing, the ALJ found that Novato violated the National Labor Relations Act by suspending the f and firing the five employees and also violated the act when Rocha asked medalists about how he planned to vote. The board affirmed the ALJ's rulings, findings, credibility determinations, and conclusions with minor modifications. This is important. We don't have to make determinations of credibility here because they've already made them. We can more or less assume that they made some kind of decent determination unless we hear of other either misconduct or what we would call an arbitrary or capricious um, decision, something that went outside the evidence, something like that. So far... Just take it at its, at its word, is what I'm trying to say. Novato has now filed a petition for review in this court, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and the NLRB has filed a cross-application for enforcement of its order. We're going to get to the good part, I swear. Under the applicable standard of review, we must uphold the judgment of the board unless its findings are unsupported by substantial evidence or it acted arbitrarily or otherwise erred in, established, in applying established law to the facts of the case. We begin with Novato's challenge, etc. An employee violates by suspending or discharging an employee for engaging in protected union activity. The board employs the judicially approved right line test. Right line is a case, W-R-I-G-H-T, uh, 251 National Labor Relations Board, 1083 at 1089, a 1980 case. So if I, so I'm not an employment lawyer, that's why I'm reading that site. That seems like it's an important citation. The board employs the judicially approved right line case test when reviewing a claim that an employer discharged an employee for protected conduct. Under that test, the general counsel must first make a prima facie showing or upfront showing sufficient to support the inference that protected conduct was a motivating factor in the discharge. Once a prima facie case has been established, the burden of persuasion shifts to the company or defendant to show that it would have taken the same action in the absence of the unlawful motive. In the proceedings below, Novato disputed the unfair labor practice charges at both steps of the right line test. With respect to the first step, the ALJ affirmed by the board readily found sufficient evidence to support the inference that anti-union animus was a motivating factor in the suspension 
and discharge of the station for employees. The record showed the ALJ recounted that the four employees visibly supported the union organizing campaign by, among other things, wearing lanyards and buttons, passing out flyers, getting employees to sign up for a showing of interest, and that their actions were visible from Trudy's office. In light of those facts, the ALJ rejected as disingenuous Novato's claims that its supervisors were unaware of the employee's union activity. She specifically declined to credit Gilman's testimony that she did not know whether the allegedly sleeping employees were union supporters since she did not notice any union lanyards or pins because Gilman also testified in incredible detail as to how the employees were positioned and claimed to have stood in front of them for some time. In addition, the ALJ noted that the suspensions and discharges occurred only a couple weeks after the filing of a representation petition and only one week prior to the representation election. And she noted also that Novato's animus was demonstrated by its contemporaneous Section 8A1 violation, Rocha's unlawful interrogation of Medalis about his preference in the representation election. You with us so far? The ALJ found additional support for the inference of animus and discriminatory motivation in the fact that Novato acted disparately. No other employees had been suspended or discharged for the same or similar allegations. She observed that in a similar situation in 2009, where an employee allegedly slept on duty, Novato did not discipline this employee even though there too was a picture of the sleeping employee. The ALJ further noted that, although just one week prior to the events at issue in this matter, one of Novato's supervisors also reported employees sleeping during the night shift, Trudy failed to investigate or follow up on this. Instead, Trudy singularly focused on Medalis, Bernalis, Brown, and Sibelino, and one can only conclude it was due to their union activity. In this court, Novato does not contest the board's finding of an unlawful motivation in discharging the employees at issue. Rather, Novato's sole contention is that it met its burden of proof under the next step of the right-line case test by proving that it would have taken the same action absent the improper motive. As it argued below... Novato maintains here that it would have terminated the four employees regardless of their union support because of the brazen nature of their conduct in sleeping on duty. The ALJ, affirmed by the board, rejected Novato's right-line defense. She rejected Trudy's testimony in its entirety for multiple reasons, including his demeanor, evasive, vague, and contradictory demeanor, and his disparate treatment of earlier sleeping-on-the-job claims. As discussed below, she specifically discredited Gilman's testimony that she saw the four employees sleeping on duty. Instead, she credited in its entirety the testimony of Brown and in relevant part the testimony of Sabellino, both of whom acknowledged that they had slept but said they did so only during their permitted 10-minute breaks. In addition, the ALJ credited the testimony of Bernalis, who testified that the only rest he took was during his permitted 30-minute meal break prior to 4 a.m., and of Medalis, who testified that he did not sleep at all during the shift. Novato acknowledges that its step two right-line argument, that it would have discharged the four employees regardless, turns entirely on whether the testimony of Gilman should be credited. Novato's success, therefore, depends on persuading us that the ALJ's conclusion about Gilman's credibility were unsupported. And the and that presents Novato with a difficult task because we do not reverse the board's adoption of the ALJ's credibility determinations unless those determinations are hopelessly incredible, self-contradictory, or patently, which would mean outwardly, unsupportable. Novato insists that it is up to this difficult task because photographic evidence fully corroborated Gilman's testimony that the Union 4 employees were sleeping for 20 minutes. That itself is an overstatement of Gil's actual testimony, which was that the employees were sleeping for at least 15 to 20 minutes. Be that as it may, Novato's argument here is in line with the position it took before the ALJ. Immediately after the October 7th incident, Gilman reported that she began her rounding at approximately 4 a.m. on October 7th and took the photo of Brown and Sebelino somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes later. At the time she made those representations, the photo Gilman had taken had no timestamp on it, 
Once she downloaded a software update on her smartphone, a timestamp appeared, indicating the picture was taken at 4.21 a.m. This indisputable timestamp evidence is totally consistent with Gilman's testimony, as well as her prior statements about, ev about the events of October 7th, that she arrived at Unit 4 slightly after 4 a.m. and took the photo 15 to 20 minutes later. Like the ALJ, we will assume that the 421 timestamp was accurate, notwithstanding some doubts in that regard. And here is where the lesson Vincent Gambini taught comes into play. A key issue in the murder trial of Vinny's cousin Bill was how many minutes had passed between the time witness Sam Tipton saw Bill enter the Sackasuds convenience store and the time he heard the gunshot. On direct examination, Tipton testified that he was sure only five minutes had passed because he saw Bill go into the store as soon as he, Tipton, started making breakfast and that the shot ran out just as his breakfast was ready to eat. On cross-examination, Vinny elicited Tipton's breakfast-making process. By the end of the cross, it was clear that Tipton could not have cooked his breakfast of eggs and grits in just five minutes. The cross-examination proceeded as follows. Well, how much time was they in the store? Five minutes. Five minutes? Are you sure? Did you look at your watch? No. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You testified earlier that the boys went into this store and that you just begun to make your breakfast. So you were ready to eat and you heard the gunshot. So obviously it takes you five minutes to make breakfast. That's right. Do you remember what you had? Eggs and grits. So too here, Gilman testified that the only time she saw a clock on the morning of October 7th was when she stopped at a stop sign three blocks from work and noticed her car's clock showed it was 3.50 a.m. On cross-examination, she initially claimed that it only takes her five to ten minutes to get from that stop sign to Station 4, where she, and sh where she said she first encountered the four sleeping employees. If Gilman really had reached Station 4 in just 5 to 10 minutes, that would indeed have put her in a position to observe the sleeping employees at Station 4 on or about, at or about 4 a.m. just as Novato's brief claimed. And if we further assume the accuracy of the 421 a.m. timestamp on the photograph Gilman took the last time she saw them sleeping, that would establish at least the two employees in the photo had been sleeping for at least 20 minutes, again, just as Novato claimed. Back to the eggs and, eggs and grits story, though. Eggs and grits. I like grits, too. How do you cook your grits? You like them regular, creamy, al dente? Uh, just regular, I guess. Regular. Instant grits? No self-respecting Southerner uses instant grits. I take pride in my grits. So, Mr. Tipton, how could you, how could it take you five minutes to cook your grits when it takes the entire grit-eating world 20 minutes? Uh, I don't know. I'm a fast cook, I guess. I'm sorry. Are we to believe that boiling water soaks into a grit faster in your kitchen than on any place on the face of the earth? I don't know. Well, perhaps the laws of physics cease to exist on your stove. Were these magic grits? Are you sure about that five minutes? I may have been mistaken. And, and for the actual performance, go watch My Cousin Vinny because it's much better than that. The problem with this timeline is the sheer number of tasks Gilman claimed to have completed between stopping at the stop sign at 3.50 a.m. and arriving at Station 4 just 5 to 10 minutes later. During the NLRB Council's cross-examination of Gilman, Council drew out the following list of activities Gilman said she completed during this period. Driven three more blocks to the Novato facility, stopping at another stop sign along the way, parked her car, went into the facility, walked to her office, logged onto her computer, checked her emails, went to the kitchen, checked the temperature logs for the refrigerator, for the walk-in refrigerator, for a walk-in freezer, checked the labels and dates for the items in the refrigerators, walked to the break room where she had used the restroom, collected Novato's union opposition campaign flyers on which someone had written derogatory stuff, gone back to her office, read the flyers and the derogatory stuff, walked down the hallway to station four, peeked into rooms along the way, 
then finally arrived at Station 4 for the first time where she saw the sleeping employees. When the union's attorney took up the tag team match during her own shot at cross-examination, she hammered the point home. Question. So it's your testimony that it only took 10 minutes to drive from the 7-Eleven near the first stop sign park to park, to go into your office, to log on to your computer, to check your email, go to the bathroom, use the restroom, clean up the break room, a little bit of these flyers, go through all these procedures that you went through in your kitchen. Answer. So roughly, I would still say about five. It wasn't that long, you know. It wasn't that long. Question. So I'm trying to figure out from that time, driving, going through another stop sign, parking, getting in, unlocking your door, putting everything down, everything you did, are you sure it was only 10 minutes or less? Or could it have been 15 or 20 minutes? Answer. No, it could not have been 15 or 20 minutes. Question. Isn't it true? You're just not sure how long it took you to get from the stop sign to station four. Four. Answer. Well, to me, it seemed like everything that I was doing, it seemed like about 10 minutes had passed. Question. But you never looked at a clock to make sure that's correct. Answer. Correct. In light of the sheer number of functions Gilman claimed to perform, all within a very short time period, the ALJ regarded her testimony as simply implausible. Moreover, Gilman's testimony about how long the tasks had taken in the aggregate was rendered even more implausible by counsel's further cross-examination about how long some of them had taken individually. In response to counsel's questions, Gilman testified that from the stop sign to the facility, that's three or four minutes. It takes three or four minutes to log on to my computer. What I did in my kitchen took a few minutes. I went over to the break room, which took three or four minutes. I went I left and went back to my office to put down the flyers and looked at them again just briefly. By Gilman's own account, then, those activities alone took about 15 minutes. Given the additional unaccounted for activities that Gilman had to complete, the ALJ reasonably concluded that the aggregate time estimate that she provided was unlikely and unbelievable due to the length of time she allocated to each task she completed before first encountering the sleeping employees. Nor was Gilman's implausible timeline testimony the only problem the ALJ had with her credibility. So, too, was Gilman's failure to photograph the other two employees who, she claimed, were also asleep at the same time at the same nursing station. So too was her failure to attempt to wake any of the four employees or to seek immediate assistance from other supervisors despite her contention or Novato's contention that the employees had to be fired because there was a dangerous risk to patients by sleeping on the job. So too was her assertion that she did not know the four were union adherents because she did not notice that they all wore pro-union lanyards and buttons despite her claim that she could recall significant details on how the employees slept because she got within arm's reach of them. And so too was Gilman's denial that she herself wore an anti-union lanyard that morning, a denial she later had to withdraw. Her testimony admitting that she, along with other supervisors, wore lanyards urging employers in capital letters to keep your voice, vote no. In the end, the ALJ simply could not find Gilman's testimony credible and rejected her version of events. The board saw no, no basis for reversing, etc. Given the absence of such evidence, combined with the contrary testimony, we find nothing unreasonable about the board's decision. Novato also disputes the board's determination that it had fired Rodriguez. Uh, emphasizes a total lack of evidence that Rodriguez did not sleep or that she was a union supporter. This argument fails because the board did not rely on such evidence to conclude that Novato committed an unfair labor practice by firing Rodriguez. Rather, the ALJ found that Novato violated the act by using Rodriguez as a pawn in the unlawful design. Um, I had this happen once um, at my company. This was this is really funny. Um, I'm going to speak anonymously about this company because I believe I have a non-disparagement clause, and I don't know how strong that is. Um, but uh, I had a fallout with a, a company that I worked for once, and I believe that they wanted to fire me or find some reason to otherwise put me on a track towards termination. And the the my supervisor, my direct supervisor, had asked me during business hours to help him research a gift for his nephew. Um, and I, being the altruistic and helpful person that I am, was happy to help him research the PlayStation and Xbox and Nintendo consoles that were just being released in 2006 or whatever. 
And that meant that I used employee, that I used company time and company resources to go on the internet and print out some reviews for the guy and give them to him. Here, I thought I was being a good employee, helping my boss, you know, even if it was a personal request, you know, just doing good things for my boss. And then literally a few days later, there was suddenly a new effort at, at corporate to, uh, uh, you know, re reprimand people who surf the internet uh, on company time. And, and, you know, I was caught up in that. Well, guess what? They tried to do this. They tried to, to, you know, make sure that they didn't just fire one person for surfing the internet. So they conducted sort of an investigation and they checked everybody's computers to see who was surfing the internet. Well, it totally backfired because it turned out they were going to have to fire literally everyone. And so no one got, no one even got reprimanded because they would have to reprimand everyone and i was i was that kind of person you know i'm i'm a lawyer now I, I was a bit i was a bit of a lawyer back then too even though i hadn't gone to law school yet i was definitely going to make a stink if i was the only one reprimanded and no one else got reprimanded so it backfired on them just like sort of like it backfired here Although Rodriguez's union views were unknown, the ALJ concluded that Novato fired her along with the other employees for fear of diluting its arguments against the discriminatees, etc. Let's see if there's anything else worth going over here. Uh, they challenged another thing and lost that as well. And so the interesting part was the citation of the My Cousin Vinny opinion as showing the importance of the timeline. So that's really interesting, and I thought you would enjoy that as uh, as as much as I did. I that have was to literally like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> just just in case anyone's not clear, my cousin Vinny is a movie. Mm -hmm. It is fictional, um, and um, it's also widely acclaimed as one of the more accurate legal dramas or movies out there basically everything that happens in that movie even the illegal stuff is fairly accurate Vinny really could lie to the judge and get away with it under those circumstances that wasn't right that was very unethical and in the larger perspective he should probably be disbarred or at least suspended for lying to the judge and maintaining the lie like that but it also helps highlight how much he really, really, really wanted to be a trial lawyer. And that makes it real. He put he put his actual career, his whole career at risk to get the opportunity to be a real trial lawyer. When my my old roommate was was taking his bar exam uh, and he he needed a, a bit of a break. And I was like, OK, we're going to watch my cousin Vinny. <laughs> um, <laughs> he had never seen it. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, you know, my cousin, so the, um, the lawyer, Vinny, uh, had failed the bar exam a few times, but it didn't mean that he wasn't a good lawyer. It didn't mean that he couldn't do the job. Yeah. Uh, that just, was also the, yeah, the moral of the story. Yeah. I th how many times did he fail? I think in it was maybe? five, like six? four, four, six or five. Time. He yeah. was six times. He was studying for six years. <laughs> <laughs> so it was one of those like, it's okay if you don't pass the first time. Vinny didn't pass the first time and he's still a good lawyer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and that's funny, but that you really should have a conversation with yourself. If you're failing the bar exam, uh, there's, there's a reason why you weren't prepared. And if you can't correct that, you really shouldn't torture yourself. You're going to have trouble with, with the law in general. Uh, just all those procedures, like, once we get to the real part, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, and I agree, Marissa Tomei steals the show on that one. Oh, like, the story yes. is great. The, My Cousin Vinny, as a movie, the script, you could just read the script and it would be great. But Marissa Tomei is a phenomenal actor, actress. And she really just takes the cake. Every I, scene that she's in, she's like <laughs> the setner. You can't help. Apparently she did win Best Actress. So that, that explains <laughs> or at least confirms some of that. It was it was one of the best. It's one of the best movies ever. I could really just watch it over and over again. 
Yeah. Once my roommate passed the bar, he bought a copy of, of the movie on DVD. <laughs> Everything that guy just said is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I li- and I literally had an opposing party say something like that once. It was the it was the the custody case that I talk about once in a while, where the opposing side was unrepresented, and we had an expert witness, the child's therapist, up on the stand, and they put on a whole thing about PTSD and you know that the child you know what the child's actual disorders were, and that they were being caused by the opposing party's unwillingness to accommodate the child's needs, basic human needs. And the, the the expert witness is now ready for cross examination, and the opposing party literally stands up and goes, "Everything she just said is a lie." Word for word, verbatim, it's exactly what she said. And I, I said, uh, uh, "Objection!" And the, and the, the, I didn't even have to say anything else. And the, the judge was like, "Sustained." <laughs> <laughs> Because usually you have to list. The you have to explain objection. objection uh, I didn't even have to. Was, objection sustained. <laughs> um, I think I think I might have actually said objection motion to strike, but uh, it was immediately sustained with no further explanation necessary. I I would struggle to like what even is this this that that of the objection um ir- irrelevant your honor uh argumentative uh uh isn't a question your honor <laughs> uh just just I just deserve Draw. it <laughs> just, <laughs> can you just give me this one please it's pretty easy judge. <laughs> Come on, Judge, this is like a softball. It's like an underhanded pass here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and she did a, did a boom, boom, rocked it right out of the park. Sustained. Uh, yeah, wasn't there one what is wasn't there one we read recently where the judge brought up the objection for the party? <laughs> I object on behalf of the plaintiff. Or you'd be like, and no, I'd be like, plaintiff, uh, do you want to object to that? <laughs> I've had that happen. I've definitely been <laughs> been prompted by the judge. Uh, uh, like counselor, do you have a response to that? Are you sure <laughs> you don't have a response to that? You sure there's nothing you'd like to say? No, no. So what happens, um, the, the ones that are really obvious are when you are in traffic court and it's the state and the state has made a mistake or something, and all you have to do is make the motion to dismiss. Sometimes the judge will go like, oh, the officer, it looks like you're, this the radar gun is out of certification. Um, a defense counsel, would you like to make a motion? <laughs> that's, that's how it will happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you like to say something? <laughs> oh, sustained. <Yeah. laughs> But no, the worst one, so on the flip side of this, the worst one was when I was in court and I went to court for one thing and it turned out there was a different thing happening. A uh, the, the matter was, was supposed to be dismissed according to my client and my client was wrong. My client had missed something in the mail or forgotten something and had not presented the paper to me, so I had missed it too. And it turned out that we were cross-examining a doctor and I had not prepared for authenticating an expert witness as an expert and i literally was asking the i said your honor i'm so very sorry i I, i'm not prepared to cross-examine the doctor today i i need you know i i asked for a continuance and he wouldn't grant a continuance and you know said that we have to continue and i said i I, unfortunately i i need to get i need to cross-examine this doctor but i i honestly do not know what the court requires of me to authenticate him as an expert witness. And the judge was very mad at me, and the judge ended up doing the job for me so that we could then uh, qualify the expert as an expert. It was embarrassing, and I will, I will remember that forever, and I will never be unprepared to qualify an expert witness again. Um, to bring it back to my cousin Vinny, that is one of the best scenes. Is And it's Dobear standard or something like that? When the Dolbear standard, yeah. Yeah, when you're trying to get someone to be qualified as a as a witness in front of the court. Not a witness, an, an expert in front of the court. Is it, is it, and, no, uh, Daubert, I think, is... Uh, or is that... The Daubert standard is for... Jurors. Oh, yeah, it is. No, 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 it is. It is. I'm confusing okay. it with the, one of the mental incapacity standards. There's like four of them. 
Yeah, so I've, that's the dog. I learned everything I know about wow. Dogger from from my cousin Vinny. <laughs> wow, you even knew the standard. You could take the bar exam. <laughs> Jeez. I test really I mean, well. I think I think Pennsylvania has a reading for the bar exam standard, which means you don't have to be a law school graduate to be a Pennsylvania lawyer. You could study as my apprentice for a number of years and then just take the Pennsylvania bar exam. Yeah, like the 1700s. <laughs> yeah, that's how it used to work, right? You oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As an apprentice. There didn't used to be a time and then... bar exam as far as I know. Yeah. A long You'd time. Just be a lawyer. You just study until the yeah until your until your apprenticeship is basically up or, or whatever. I don't know the all the details there. Thank you very much to our Patreon supporters and our Twitch subscribers. Supposedly, Brandon has discovered a way to extract the Twitch subscriber list, so we will be incorporating the Twitch subscribers into the crawl and the patron panel and the reward list and all that. For now, please remember that this is a, a community-supported channel. Um, this does this this was only possible. We we can only pay Brandon and only offset the cost of the channel and. Um, and, and make it possible to make four or five videos for you a week by uh, your donations and support, uh, both monetarily and other ways, but primarily monetarily. You know, it's, it's awkward to ask for money, but that's really what support means, is that we're asking you to give us money through patreon.com slash ljfrench for the month of March 2019. Thank you very much to our $50 plus supporters, Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, Vera Mantain, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan Gray, Daniel Perez, and As Bernari. And thank you very much to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the LED panel behind me and will be on the crawl. And like I said, we'll add the Twitch supporters when we can. Um, I'll leave some room here for dog video. This week, we look forward to releasing the videos that we uh, went over this morning. Um, I'll release a Supreme Courtship video. We'll go over the soccer players that sued for, for gender discrimination, the NCAA players who can now receive unlimited education benefits, but still have a cap on their non-education or cash pay, the fake subpoena story, the My Cousin Vinny opinion, and then the Fomance opinion all sound like great stories to release this week. So I look forward to all of that. Love you all. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you all for being lawful masses, and I will see you this week. Bye. All right, I see three balls, up four, and then Ilsa. How are you guys? The snow is kind of slushy and wet. It'd be a good workout. For... Oh, great shot. Good, yeah, that was a good shot. Do we have a uh, a ball thrower? Yeah. Give them a little workout before I go.